Hello and welcome to another edition of Truth and Rhythm, brought to you by FunkinStuff.net. This is the interview show that gets deep into the pocket with contemporary music's foremost masters of the groove. Available in video format at FunkinStuff.net and on YouTube. Truth and Rhythm can also be enjoyed on the go in its audio podcast edition from iTunes and other leading providers. I'm your host, Scott Dr. GX Goldfine, musicologist and author of Everything's on the One, The First Guy to Funk. If you don't have your copy, get on over to Amazon and get one today. Whether you're watching or listening, I thank you as always for your support and interest. And today, my guest is keyboardist, singer, composer, producer, Keith Chop Chop Harrison, an original member of the funk band Fazo and subsequent member of the Mighty Heat Wave and Grammy winning Daz Band. Hailing, hailing from Ohio's ground zero of funk, Dayton, Harrison has recorded such funk classics as Riding High, Good Thing, and Breaking the Funk with Fazo. Gangsters of the Groove, Jitterbug, and Post Until Closing, and Letting It uh, Loose with Heat Wave, and on the one for fun, Swoop Joystick, and Let It All Blow for the Daz Band. What a list of jams. There's so many other gems tucked away on the 10 albums he recorded with those groups. Through the years, Harrison has also recorded or performed with the Ohio Players, Morris Day in the Time, P-Funk, Jeff Lorber, and Charlie Wilson. As part of the Daz Band, he was inducted into the R&B Music Hall of Fame, and this year, he released his first solo album called One Love. As far as I'm concerned, he is one of Funk's best-kept secrets, but we aim to try to change that today. So with that, Keith, you're on the air. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Uh, it's an honor to be on your show and to share uh, with the viewers out there. Uh, some of uh, my background and what I've done and what I'm still doing. Excellent. So glad that you are still at it. So we're all very glad about that. Where are you coming to us from? Are you in Dayton today? I'm in Dayton, Ohio. I'm sitting here in my studio and uh, actually uh, I've been recording with uh, uh, band leader and guitarist Steve Shockley with Lakeside. Okay. We're working on a song. So He's scheduled to be in the studio at six o'clock today. Okay, all right, very good. So, uh, are you getting any snow there yet? Not yet. It's all up north in Cleveland, and <laughs> and it can stay up north. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Now you we don't don't want to break. break. Not ready to get that shovel out yet, right? No, <laughs> I just got a snow blower last year. Can you believe it? Oh, all the large. <laughs> All right, Keith. Well, unless uh, you got anything else for me off the bat, we're going to jump into some questions. Okay. Well, you know, of course, I want to push my my first solo CD, uh, which is out now on all your digital out downloads. It's called K. Harrison, One Love, uh, R&B Soul. And, uh, and, you know, I'm asking all the view, viewers to go out there, check it out, download it. You won't be disappointed. Yeah, I can vouch for that. We'll talk about it a little more, a little okay. deeper in, but uh, absolutely congratulations on that. Thank you. Thank you. So, Keith, how did you get into music? How did you get started? Uh, were you from a musical family? Did you have formal training? What's that backstory? Well, yeah, you know, at, at the age of uh, uh, 10, I wanted to play uh, organ at the time. And my parents bought me a, a little organ. It had the push buttons on the left side and the keys on the right. And as I got older, when I became 18, I was also athletic. So I was trying to make a decision in my life. Should I play sports or should I stay in music? Of course, growing up, high school played in uh, a lot of high school bands. Uh, we had a band called the Medallions. We won a first place on the show wagon which went around to all the rec parks and we performed on this, this flat bed that a truck pulled around. And eventually uh, some of us who were in the medallions went on to become phase three, but, uh, and then phase O. But what happened at 18, I asked my mother, I said, mom, where, where does this inner talent come from that I wanna play piano? And my mother, sat behind a piano and opened up the hymn book and she started reading and playing. I said, Mom, what? You could have been teaching me. 
<laughs> she said your dad didn't want you to be in music. He said because it's bad. It's all drugs and alcohol. And and man, I cried like a baby. And and I owe it to my father. I was so mad. I said I'm gonna make it in music and prove to him that God gave me this gift to do this. And that's what drove me to stay in music. Wow. Yeah, you know, because we, we grew up on a, a little seven-acre farm out in Jefferson Township here in Dayton, Ohio. We had pigs, chickens, and a pony. We had a big orchard, and all the kids would come to our farmhouse because it was like a recreational place. My father built a half-court basketball rim. We had a baseball field we turned the cornfield into, and we had we used the orchard as our, our track. We would run around and so everything was right there, you know, you had it right there. And, and uh, it was great growing up on the farm. Well, wow. has it built up a lot since then? No, uh, actually, that area has, has gone down uh, out in Jefferson Township. You know, a lot of a lot of the kids never moved back to that particular area. But as time went on uh, from uh, when I graduated, my father said, well, you're not going to lay around here and do nothing. I don't care if you got to put S up and down the street. You're going to get a job. So I listened into the military. I went into the military, went to the Air Force, uh, uh, served uh, over in Guam doing Cambodian bombing, and they shipped me back to Dayton. So what that did, I, it en enabled me to hook back up with the group at the time, which was phase three. And we were playing, uh, I think it was at the Postman's Ball. And we were getting ready to leave to go to Atlanta, Georgia, to hook up with Taurus Productions. Well, we were at this uh, Postman's Ball. The late Clarence Satchel of the Ohio Players came and saw us. And he walked up to the stage and he says, I like you guys. He says, I got $24,000 and I want to take you in the studio. And we were like, wow, that's Clarence Satchel of the Ohio Players. He said, if you're interested, be over, be over at my house tomorrow noon and we'll talk. And at the time, I wasn't the leader of the group. Uh, the bass player was Tyrone Crumb. So we had three uh, horn players, and, and uh, the horn players was like, man, this something just don't feel right. And we said, well, it won't hurt to check it out. So we went over there and we sat in his drive for two hours before he came out. And we asked him, why did you make us wait so long? He said, I just wanted to see how dedicated you were uh, if you really wanted this. So when we went in, he took uh, Tyrone back to an office. We we're all sitting around. Tyrone comes back and he says, man, it's going to be all right. And, uh, so we took a vote to stick around, see what's gonna happen. Horn players left uh, the group and uh, the rest is history. Went in the studio. We started recording the Riding High uh, record. And uh, uh, we, uh, Satchett looked up the trade. There was a trademark on phase three. So we had to come up with another name and. Uh, the lead singer, Bip, came up with, the with O. Let's call the group Phase O. We said, yeah, the O can represent Ohio. Mm -hmm. And uh, the rest is history from there, you know. So we did three albums, uh, Riding let me, High. Let, let, let me jump, let me in. jump in. Thank you. So, so uh, uh, when you first uh, got with Satch, that was like 76? Are we talking around there? Uh, we're talking, yeah, 76. Okay. Going in this, and we waited my whole year. I think we recorded in '77. Uh, and the album was released in '78 because we we toured with the Ohio Players. We opened up for them. We were the opening act. So you opened for them uh, before, or after you actually had the record out. Before we had a record. Sometimes they would bill us as another group. <laughs> I won't mention names of some of those groups. <laughs> I guess that was to draw people. Uh, you didn't have but, to wear masks or anything, or, or, or no. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, we would get our fifteen minutes of fame. That's all we were given was fifteen minutes. So in the fifteen minutes, we would play cover songs. Uh, 
And we, we, we did cover songs very good because we would play like maybe uh, five minutes of the actual song and then we would put our thing into it. And people kind of like that. So what, what struck you about Satch at that time? Obviously, he was a little bit into doing sort of like kind of a little power head game thing as in the beginning <laughs> with that test. But what, what was he like? And, like and about what, <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, as you know, the change of command in the group changed. I, I became the leader, and I started paying more attention to the business uh, and how Satch was operating things. Uh, it was pretty much, you know, uh, it was a, a good learning lesson of how not to do some things, but it was a good learning lesson, too, of uh, how uh, the industry worked. And uh, uh, for the most part, uh, he was he was a pretty good guy, you know, uh, showing the ropes, introducing us to different, you know, to uh, people in the uh, industry, uh, especially uh, uh, radio. That's when I learned how important radio is. Even today, radio is still important. With all the social media, radio is still important. And you got to meet the other members of the band. What got to meet the other members of the band? Uh, some of them weren't too happy because they had groups, and I guess they wanted their groups to go in the studio first. But that's when Satch pushed his weight around and said, no, I'm taking my group in first. So there was some haters that <laughs> didn't like us, you know, but, uh, you know, we got our, we got our, our opportunity and, and we were the first ones and that was good. Well, you know, Keith, uh, the Hot Players were my first favorite band. First record I ever got was Skin Tight. You can probably yeah. see up over my shoulder there. The uh, see, I was, Looking, where'd you get all those records from? Uh, well, the Fire Wine is signed by Sugar, so yeah. Sugar was a real cool guy, man. He was about he was probably the coolest one in the group. You know, very uh, knowledgeable about things and, and very calm about certain things. Uh, and I like that about him because he studied yoga. You know, and uh, he would meditate a lot. So, Keith, tell me what it was like when you went in the studio, though, for the first time and started working in that environment, and, and how much guidance did you get from Sag versus just coming from yourself or other members of the band? Oh, man. Um, first time in the studio, it was awesome. Uh, I didn't realize, you know, you'd be in the studio that long, uh, but back in the day, the way they did it, and we're talking, you know, the 70s, because uh, they would splice tape. It's mm -hmm. not like technology today, cut, copy, and paste. <laughs> but uh, we would basically go in and start playing a groove. And Satch would say, okay, go to, we'll say we we're playing an E, and he would say, okay, go to A, or go to C. And basically we'd take the, the best parts of those grooves, splice them, and, and put them together, now you got your track to make a song. And then we work on lyrics and things of that nature. Um, but we had already had a, a pile of stuff from playing in the clubs, uh, some grooves and ideas uh, uh, that we had had to, to do. And the thing that, that intrigued me the most and when we get to the heat wave era, uh, a lot of vocal arrangements and vocal recording I learned from Rod Temperton, uh, but how to stack voices, that was really uh, amazing to me and interesting to me uh, to make a song sound full mm. and overdubs and things of that nature. So uh, it was real, it was real good. And, and the time it took, uh, it would take maybe an hour just for the engineer to work with the drummer tuning the drums. Uh, even with technology, a lot of uh, uh, new artists don't understand. You still got to tune uh, electronic drums, you know, to whatever key that you're going to be playing. In. It's real important uh, uh, to to you know real musicians. So, but that that was what was really interesting to me, and uh, the constant do it again, do it again. <laughs> 
do it again. <laughs> How many times do you want me to stay? So we go in at seven in the evening. We come out at seven in the morning. Wow. So riding high in particular, you know, how did you come up with that motif of that song? And was it very different in its early stages? How did it evolve? Riding high evolved, um, and uh, that's when I was, uh, you know, dabbling in drugs a little bit, alcohol. I was taking like seven fourteens. It's a downer, and I was sitting in my apartment and. I had an 88 Fender Rose uh, piano with satellite speakers. And I just started playing the groove. Boom, 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 boom. Once, you know, the high kicked in. So I'm, I'm playing now. I started, I think, about 7 in the evening. And it was 5 in the morning. I was still laying on that groove because I couldn't think of a change. Mm -hmm. And my wife said, Honey, please, please go to bed. You're playing the same thing over and over again. So that that was the basic of the song. So when uh, I got with the group and uh, we added all the other elements, but still had no no lyrics. So we played in Atlanta. We're coming back from Atlanta, and I popped a, I think it was a, a Black Beauty, <laughs> and uh. I told the guy riding shotgun, I said, man, I got a vibe for riding high. Take her out. I still have the actual original lyrics on the hotel uh, stationery. Oh. So I said, I'm riding high, riding down the highway. I'm riding high, and I literally, I can't feel my body. I'm riding high, and I look back, and everybody was asleep want to take you on a trip with me. I'm riding high. Now, this is the killer. The lyric says, there's a funk in the breezeway. What do you think that was? <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying, Doug? I, I, I let some gas. Mm -hmm. And that's what that lyric is. I'm riding high. You know, I'm riding high. So, can't free my mind. Want to take you on a First, it, the second verse, Bip, the lead singer, wrote, and everything was pertaining to trucks, but, and Satch said, radio would never play that. So we flipped it to a love high. We made the second verse a love high. But the reason it's so popular because it's one of them grooves that people can relate to if they're sipping on some kind of uh, alcohol beverage or what have you. And that's why it's lasted this long. I mean, Ice Cube is recorded in Snoop Dogg. Uh, still today, we, we're still getting royalty checks, you know, so that's a blessing. Yeah. I'm getting paid more now than I did when we first released it. So when it blew up like it did, um, how did that change your life? Well, you know, we didn't realize that it, that it blew up because we were on She Records, which was created by Clarence Satchel. And it stood for serving human equality. But there was no, it was just a label. There was nobody working the record. And we were distributed by Atlantic Cotillion. So there was really no record company, no, no AR people, no promotion people. Just radio just took it. So if we had pushed, uh, it went to number nine out of the top 100 on billboard charts. And if we had the administration people behind it, no, it would have been exploded now because we were working all the time. We were gigging all the time. So, I mean, we heard it on the radio a lot, but nothing registered that it blew up until later on. We said, you know, man, maybe this record's gonna go to platinum. We still don't know today. <laughs> You still don't know today. So you Sorry. followed it up with um, um, good thing, good, good thing, and breaking the funk. And those those songs got some action, some play, right. but never quite hit the level again of writing high. No, um, were you disappointed in that? Why do you think that very, it was very, very disappointed? Again, there was no push. There was no one working the record. You know, uh, there was nobody working the record. 
that's why a lot of people when they dig into uh some of those albums they'll find there's some good stuff on there like funky reputation uh space people um you know uh who loves you uh, but we just didn't get the push and uh that that kind of took us down the, the second cover was that ohio players influenced in the the good thing cover a little bit uh yeah i i i, I would say so uh because you know when they did that we weren't around yeah. so sash did it uh but I liked it when I saw it. <laughs> the way she was licking that ice cream cone made it look like a good thing. What's not to like? Yeah, right. What I didn't like was putting our pictures on the back in a rose petal. I, I, I don't know what that was about. <laughs> we had no control over the artwork or anything like that. So, you know, as as time went on, we kind of felt like you know, we even though we were able to. Uh, get in the door and record records we always felt we weren't treated like artists should have been treated you know like we're gonna give them what we can give them and do what we can do and that's it so keith before you guys broke up what would you say maybe are one or two of the most unforgettable men unforgettable memories as part of the FISO experience for you? Oh, wow. Uh, I would say for me was uh, being in front of 60,000 people uh, uh, the nights that we opened up with the players and once we hit riding high, how the crowd just went crazy. Uh, that was one, one of the biggest thrills for me. Uh, and meeting radio people, uh, doing promotional, you know, back then was record in stores where you go to the record stores and sign autographs and you see all these fans and you're saying to yourself, well, if all these people are, you know, your record got to be selling. Uh, so uh, that, was, that, was, that was one of the biggest moments uh, for me, being able to be on a big stage in front of all those people. No butterflies for you? I still get butterflies today a little bit, but once the, once once the first note is out, it's over. I love I love to entertain. I love it. I can't wait to 2018 because that's when I plan to to go back out. And actually, I'm gonna start overseas first. Okay. And how'd you get the Chop Chop nickname? Uh, because when I would play the clavinet, they said it looked like I was chopping. And I would do riff, and then I had big long sideburns like oh. I had back in the day, and they called them chop chops. <laughs> who, who 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 called you that? Who who first? Uh, I don't know. Who nicknamed me chop chop. I really I don't remember. Yeah, somebody in the band did. So Keith, talk to me a little bit about that data and. Uh, funk music scene you know it's legendary at this point and it's about time that it started getting as much attention as it has in recent years but why was it so fertile um especially for funk um uh, good question you know we, we get asked this all the time um a lot of people say well the Ohio players started but uh, you know, you have a, a, a wealth of musicians here who have funk in their soul. Uh, most people migrated from the South here. Uh, so, that, you know, they had blues and we had a lot of rhythm. So combining the, the rhythm and blues uh, personnel created a certain, a certain sound, which people just labeled it funk, you know. Uh, and everybody back in the day had their own kind of groove, you know, uh, from the slaves, the sun to Dayton, um, to the Trotmans, to the players, uh, you know, uh, platypus. It was just a, it was just a wealth of music artists right here. 
we never figured out why a, a rec I did eventually why a record company never blossomed because you had too many people wanting to be chief and not enough Indians. Mm. You know, mm -hmm. that had always been been part of the problem. I think it was too much clashing going on uh, between groups. Uh, you would think, why hasn't there been a funk tour of Dayton groups? Again, it's, you know, it's just too many eagles getting are are interfering with what's going on with that. At at the time, did you have any clue? Did you think, you know, looking around you, wow, there's a lot of music here. This is, oh uh, yeah, we always knew it, you know. But yeah. uh, again, everybody was kind of into doing their own thing. You know, we were out to we were first ones out the box. You know, uh, after the the Ohio players and Slade took off and Lakeside moved to California uh, and they were doing their thing on the West Coast and uh, Slade was doing their thing on the East Coast. We were doing our things based out of Dayton. Platypus was in and out. Dayton came about. Sun came about. Uh, so, uh, and Heat Wave was the international group, you know, uh, so uh, that's pretty much everybody was doing their own thing. Yeah. Looking back now, you must think pretty amazing, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Real amazing. <laughs> blessed. Yeah. Really blessed. So what ultimately led to the demise of Faisal, though? Was it just that you weren't hitting it like you had hoped? Uh, what What happened when you guys splintered? Well, I was the first one to, to leave the group because there was some interim internal things going on uh, that um, forced me to leave. Um, and uh, two weeks later, I got a call from Keith Wilder from Heatway. And uh, because when I was with Fazo, he was trying to hook me up with them then. And I said, man, you know, we got to, you know, I got the group Fazo and we were number nine on the charts. And then I saw Heatwave coming in. Heat wave kept going up and we weren't going anywhere. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they became the number one group uh, on the chart. But, uh, it, it, you know, um, I don't know what happened after that. When I asked the guys, uh, they said eventually, they said they tried to keep it going, but um, Roger left the drummer and started playing with Slade. Uh, and the formula wasn't there anymore. And so the group decided to uh, disband. Did any of it have to do with the uh, uh, friction that was going on within the Ohio players as well? Uh, part of that, too, because, you know, our records weren't selling anymore, so we weren't getting the gigs like we were getting them. So the group was pretty much, was pretty much staying idle a lot and just playing at clubs around uh, town, and uh, some of that was, uh, but the majority for me to leave was uh, some inter internal things going on within uh, the Faso band. So, what were the uh, Wilder, Keith, and and um, um, Johnny? What were what what were they like? What were those guys like? Oh man, uh, when I first got with Heat Wave. It, it was such a different experience because um, it was all about vocals, you know. Um, and Johnny, I, I never, I've never heard a tenor that was smooth as him. Yeah. Uh, and this was uh, right, right when he had his accident. Heatwave didn't do anything for two years. Because they were they were shocked, they were they were stunned. Mm -hmm. So um, when Johnny um, got a little better, and him and Keith went back and forth about Keith continuing to to keep the group going, uh, and we decided Johnny decided to do uh, uh, a couple of albums, which was Candles and Heat Wave Current were the last uh, two albums. So. Uh, we, we would be out on tour and 
uh, playing the songs and Johnny would be out at the board and he would have a mic out at the board and he was tapped into our monitors. And you, you sang in Boogie Nights and all of a sudden you hear Johnny's voice say, Keith Edward, you're flat. <laughs> <laughs> Where'd that come from? Keith Harrison, you missed the key. <laughs> oh my God. You know, so Johnny, Johnny tried to stay involved as much as he could. Uh, and uh, when we went in the studio, that's when I was able to meet Rod Temperton. Uh, you know, of course, he was one of the greatest writers that, that ever lived. He wrote Michael Jackson's biggest album, Off the Wall. And uh, so Rod was, I started talking with Rod, I said, so tell me, where do you get your ideas from? He says he, he got his ideas from movies. He says, if you go to my house, you see hundreds and hundreds of beta, uh, Betamax movies. I said, wow, okay. And Heat Wave, most groups would, would dub four times. You know, you know, stereo left and stereo right. Uh, you know, dub twice, twice. Heat Wave would dub eight. So just think you have a, a four part harmony group of harmonies and you overdub that eight times and it spread it across the speakers. And when I heard that, I was like, I, I knew then that I wanted to learn about recording more. And so when Rod, and Rod had three sets of lyrics to every one song with three different melodies. So if he sung it one way, and he said, well, I don't know. He said, well, okay, listen to it this way. Uh, or the lyrics, okay, check out these lyrics. So that's that's when I knew this man's putting some work in. So I knew if, if I wanted to be a, a great writer, the production hadn't come in yet. I think that's something that's kind of natural in the person after you spend a lot of time in, in studio recording. I started getting busy. You know, because uh, I said, I, I want to be like Rod. I want to be like Rod. And Rod would give Heat Wave first Gibby's on any song he wrote. And Johnny would either say yes or no. And when he brought Rock With You, we would we actually recorded Rock With You. And Johnny said, it's not me. I'd be curious, curious to hear that. Yeah, yeah. I think I got I got that recording on cassette somewhere around, you know, the studio of rock with you. I got some heat wave recordings that nobody's heard that we did in the studio. Wow. Yeah. So uh that you know, that that was really, you know, I said, Wow, this is deep. So uh Johnny was like a general, you know. Uh but the reason I didn't stay with Heat Wave because uh it wouldn't let nobody else write. You know, uh, it was basically Rod doing all the writing. And uh, I realized that I'm a writer. You know, I'm a writer. You know, you know the, the, I gotta say about my Temperton, um, he had a sound that was unique and distinctive no matter who was doing it. You know, I always could tell you know, when he did uh, tracks on Herbie Hancock's records or on uh, yeah. Rufus or whoever it was, I was like, even before I knew Saw Credits, I was like, that sounds like a temperate track, you know? He recorded Give Me the Nights, uh, a couple more that, that you heard went to other groups. But, you know, one of the things he did, uh, I want to throw in there, uh, he, he would voice this harmony, and I was like, that note sounds off. He said, that's called a cluster chord. I said, what's, or a zebra chord. He said, what's a cluster chord? It's like taking a major and adding a minor note somewhere or sharp in there. But he says, in the mix, he would have that vocal part just enough that would draw the ear, you know? And that was a, a technique of pulling people into your music. Not were they only great hooks, but you know, great lyrics. Wow. So, you know, those two records, uh, Candles and um, was it Current? Yeah, Heat Wave Current. Yeah, so those two albums, 
they were pretty solid, you know, and they had some good tracks. But for some reason, the tracks didn't get to the same heights as, you know, like uh, no. Boogie Nights or, or the Groove Line. Um, why do you think that was? Because I think music was changing then. Music started to change then, you know. Uh, that's when uh, um, from those type of rhythms, uh, I got what music was coming in at that time in the early 80s. Uh, it was, I think, Funk was starting to to push into to that era, and uh, I, I don't I don't know, but I think it was the changing of the music that people were listening to started to change across the board. Well, for those who haven't gotten into those records, I recommend them. Oh yeah, yeah, good stuff on there. Yeah, closing the closing, you know. Uh, jitterbugging, we're going jitterbugging all through the night. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah oh really man, cool chorus. Like you said, all the vocal stuff going on. Really, some fun times, man. Greg Villa Games coming in the studio. I mean, and and Bilbo, uh, uh, who's from Czechoslovakia. Bilbo is the only drummer I ever saw that could play that shuffle, man, and and keep it keep that tempo. You know. That's hard to do a shuffle and stay on tempo. Uh, that was his thing, you know. Uh, so when you when you toured with them, was the crowd different from your Faso crowds, or pretty oh, yeah. similar? We, it, it was a much more uh, diverse audience. Faso was uh, strictly pretty much uh, minorities, but when when Heatway and even with the Daz band. Uh, well, Heatway was a more diverse audience. Uh, you had more uh, uh, Caucasians than, than uh, Blacks. And Daz Band it was almost predominantly a uh, white audience than, than uh, a Black audience. Oh. So before talking about the Daz Band, I just want to you know pay respects to Keith, who left us recently yeah, so uh, i just went to his funeral uh last weekend and actually sung at his funeral uh and uh we must uh continue to pray for his family i mean that that they were a close tight niche loving family uh, linda and the kids and uh, it was it was it was a great home going and had people from france from germany from England come over. Uh, even Roy came, Roy Carter, who was a part of he play. Uh, so uh, he did the eulogy. And uh, Keith's gonna be missed, man. We stayed, you know, every time he would come to Dayton and visit his mom, we got together and hooked up. Anytime I was down in Atlanta, we went to his house. And he actually named uh, his son, Keith Jr., he, he nicknamed him Chop Chop. <laughs> yeah. me, you know, so. Uh, right. He's gonna great. He's gonna be missed greatly. I went out and did a couple of shows before he had his uh, stroke and heart attack with him when uh, it was like the seventies uh, uh, golden show where they had the orchestra. They had one band, but you had all these seventies and eighties groups on the show, and that band backed him up in uh, a song with him. Uh, but uh, man, you know. Yeah, we've had far too many, far too many greats leaving us in the last few years, and yes, yeah, especially uh, when you look, when you think Heatway, man, you look at those, the people uh, who were the front runners of that group. Uh, first, Johnny, then Rod, now Keith. You know, uh, man, you know, that's that's history right there. Yeah, well, that legacy is powerful and lives on, no doubt about that. Yes, yes.